thank you, Ajit, for the nice introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, come to ICTS. Uh, I've uh, had the privilege of being associated with ICTS right from the time it started in, you know, from Mumbai and uh, then, of course, here. And uh, so I was uh, asked by Anupam to talk about the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, which happens to be in the field that I work in, cosmology. Uh, more, more half of it is. And I wanted to uh, give you some idea of what is the, you know, real uh, path that these guys um, went through. What is the, you know, uh, excitement of this area or why such a, you know, area should get a Nobel Prize. So let's begin with the Nobel Prize this year. was uh, shared half and half between these two gentlemen and uh, uh, Jim Peebles here. So these was uh, these two were in, uh, involved in the first discovery of a planet orbiting a solar type star outside our solar system, and Jim Peebles kind of got a lifetime of achievement award. Uh, he has done so much in cosmology that it's very difficult to pinpoint one single work and say, "Oh, this is the Nobel Prize winning work." But I try to point out to the you know. Uh, importance of his presence in the field and how he has led the field onwards. Uh, so let's talk about the cosmic stage. So this is uh, more directed towards, uh, you know, young, younger students, but this is how beautiful the sky looks to us. And that's why I guess cosmology became one of the fields uh, of human quest right from the beginning to understand where is our place in this, uh, you know, myriad of stars that you see. These are all mostly in our galaxy, what you see here. But if you were to peer in a region far away from the galaxy and peer deep enough with your best uh, telescope, so this is an image from a Hubble, uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope in this region, which has no foreground stars, you would see galaxies and you'd see galaxies as far as you can look. We are looking so far back in time that some of these galaxies are absolutely just uh, beginning to form. So you can peer back into the universe and it's a vast universe full of galaxies and we are just a speck of dust in our own galaxy. So a galaxy is a huge object. There are 100 billion galaxy and the sun is one of the average stars which weighs 10 to 30 kilos, right? So the whole scale of cosmology is something that one needs to get used to. We measure distances in parsec, which is about 3.26 light years. And so it takes uh, light 300,000 years uh, to go across from one end of the galaxy to the other. So galaxy is a huge object by itself. So now let's begin with one part, the first half of the Nobel Prize. So that was to find our own place in this galaxy itself. And we have just made a beginning there. So if you look at all the exoplanets that have been discovered till date, they only are in our, rather in our neighborhood of in the galaxy itself, you know, very close by. And this is the region we have mapped out. But this nevertheless is a great quest. We have already, you know, uh, many hundreds of uh, exoplanets that have been discovered, many of them very similar to uh, Earth, some in the habitable zone. So it's, it's a thriving area. And the two people, Michel Mayer and Didier Colors, got the uh, Nobel Prize for making their sensational discovery of uh, planet orbiting a star which was rather similar to the sun. And this is the name of the star and the planet has a name, you know, associated with the star. And this is also fairly close to Earth. It takes 50 years for light to travel between them. And the principle behind this is very simple physics. So you know that if the Earth, uh, if the Earth or, you know, a planet is going around the sun, the, actually, the motion is around the center of mass. So while we do not really uh, always see that, but since the sun is, uh, you know, the star is much heavier, the 
star does wiggle, jiggle around because of the motion of the planet, right? And it's a very, very tiny effect. So the whole key thing was, and how to detect a star moving is to look at the light and look at it through a spectroscope and then see red shift and blue shift happening. And the resolution of your spectroscopy should be such that you should be able to see motions at few meters per second. And this is what they achieved. So when you could get to level of uh, measuring dist uh, velocities in Doppler shifts of such small amounts is the you know uh, great credit that goes to these people to come up with this idea. There are nevertheless many other ways of detecting exoplanets to transit and things like that and this is a flourishing field so it's uh, quite nice. Uh, what I liked about the Nobel Prize is there were two disparate fields which were being awarded, but they managed to bring it to the under common theme of our place in the universe. So indeed, this is kind of telling you that we inhabit a planet very much like many others, even in our neighborhood. There was optical observations? Yes. Yeah, these are optical observations. Yes. So then uh, let me move to the realm of cosmology. So as I said, this galaxy is just one of billions. So if you, if you look at our local neighborhood, in cosmological sense, where you know 100 million light years is the stick here. Uh, every dot here is a galaxy, so you see kind of a cloudy structure around you. This is the atlas of the universe around us. Uh, each of these are major clusters or superclusters: Hercules, uh, Coma cluster here, Virgo cluster very close to us, and goes on like that. If you zoom out further, then this is kind of an atlas of all galaxies that you can map out in the universe. We are at the center here in this picture. It's a 3D kind of a foamy structure of galaxy. What is remarkable is this thing, of course there is marked structure in this, but if you look at a typical box, you pick up any box you want, typically it would look something like this. This, this is kind of a picture of a mapped map of all galaxies that are there. Yes, yes. So this, this definitely is from the two degree field. I'm not completely sure about that, okay? This is uh, a three, a uh, hundred mega, this is like this box is hundred megaparsec on the side. Box from the two degree field survey. It's actual data. Each galaxy here is a really a galaxy and color coded by the color of the galaxy. The milky thing, of course, is not something that you see, but uh, first of all, guides the eye to see the density contrast. And typically, you can see that there is a rich, organized uh, structure in the that you see. So I'm looking at cosmology, not from a historical perspective, but as if we are starting cosmology now with all the data. So if you look at this, this is the kind of system you'd be given now. And you have to analyze it like a physicist, and this is where Jim Peebles came in. He was the first person to, I mean, not probably the first person Dickey told him to do so, according to him, but uh, to say, use the standard laws of physics and try to understand the universe. It's, it's kind of a complex thing. So he started looking at clustering of matter. And this is a famous book that uh, Beeples had uh, penned in 1980. And I think almost everyone who's done cosmology in the generations after that, you know, ought, would have looked through it. I mean, it has, the first ideas of how you can write basic, uh, you know, perturbation theory equations of density perturbations and how they grow. And so this is how it started. Of course, this picture, I, when I got it, by the time they had already put a label of Nobel Prize, but you know, of course the original book didn't have it. So this is uh, an attempt by a physicist or you know, him representing the physics community in taking on the challenge of understanding the universe as we see it now. It's, it's a immensely large universe. And also, if you just look at the distribution of galaxies, it's extremely complicated. I mean, it's just like a condensed matter physics system or, you know, a biological, you know, petri dish or something like that. It's just kind of a very remarkable structure. So as physicists do, uh, one has to look for the simplicity in it. And you look for an appropriate simple model. Again, to a point to Jim Peebles. So let's 
look for a simple model. It's not that he looked for it, but he pointed that out in his textbook again. Uh, this is from his second textbook, which is again a thicker book on cosmology, uh, which late, well, came out much later, I think probably in the 90s, which has a picture from the Lick Observatory Survey in the 70s. So he wanted to point out the following, that if, if you did not worry about where the how far the galaxies were, but project all known galaxies are back onto the sky, what is pretty clear to uh, you at one glance is this is the entire sky. Of course, the galaxy masks a part of the sky, which nowadays with infrared, you don't have so much uh, of a problem. But you see that none of the directions the sky is crying out for attention. It looks, of course, there's structure, but no, no, it's not as if the northwest direction has huge number of galaxies, whereas something not. So on the average, the universe does appear to, the distribution of galaxies in the universe appears to be isotropic around us. Then, of course, uh, we also learned this lesson the you know, hard way that, you know, we should not think that we are special. So we used to have this um, Earth-centric view, but, you know, we know that uh, Earth is not the center of the universe. Similarly, our galaxy has no reason to be the center of the universe. So it must be isotropic around every galaxy. So isotropy around every point as uh, I mean, to this audience, I don't need to tell you, it's just a mathematical theorem which tells you that distribution is homogeneous. So even from the current universe data, you can extract out, abstract out this simplicity that a good approximate model of the matter distribution is that it is statistically uh, homogeneous uh, distribution. Now you run it through general relativity it's one of the simplest problems in general relativity, as I keep emphasizing to people. Uh, now a lot of times people teach the black hole solution as the simplest solution, but I insist that this much simpler solution is the cosmological solution because you know you have absolutely smooth matter and couple it, but the results are remarkable. You know that moment you have. I'm sorry. So isn't it attracted like the gaps in so yeah. smoothness, but it is. It has clustering on smaller scales, so it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's uh, so when I said it, it's homogeneous, I meant statistically uh, this region or that region more or less statistically is the same, right? Sorry, I'm going the other way. This region versus this region or this region, yeah. It, yeah so that is it's so there is clustering at small scales, and which is what uh, Jim Peebles pointed to in his thing that we need to study that clustering universe. But as a backdrop to that, I'm telling you what the background universe is. And uh, so the, this led to the expanding models of the universe. So it, on cosmic scales, uh, and this is important, on cosmic scales of few hundred parsecs, the universe is statistically homogeneous and it is expanding. And uh, then, Basically, the picture is that every galaxy is moving away from each other, which is the most obvious way to understand Hubble's law, right? So Hubble's law uh, tells you that the more distant a galaxy is from you, the faster it seems to be receding away from you if you measure the redshift, okay? And one way to think of it is to think of a, you know, magic membrane where, which is expanding, you know, without any trouble as much as you want. And then the model of this uh, model is so simple that if you know the present expansion rate, which is the separation rate at which two galaxies are separating from each other, so two galaxies 10, kilo, uh, 10 megaparsecs apart will be moving away from each other at 710 kilometers per second. Okay, of 100 parsecs is 7,000. So this scale itself, the expansion rate itself, tells you what is the characteristic density of the universe. Again, this points to the simplicity of the problem. So we have a very simple model of cosmology in the background, okay? But it is quite enigmatic. I mean, it takes most of the things, as I tell students, is the maths and the physics is standard maths, standard physics. The arena is something that you've got to get used to. So you think of, you know, nice examples of stretching elastic bands and things like that. And all the physics is very simple to understand there. So this characteristic density uh, pops out of this expansion rate directly. 
And that tells you, I mean, that's any physicist would like to know what is the characteristic densities that you're dealing with in your system, okay? And we express the density of all kinds of matter that may be in the universe in terms of uh, this characteristic density. So you take that energy density and divide it by the characteristic density and call it a capital omega of a various, of a different kind. So this is the energy density of matter that clusters under gravity. This is energy density of matter that does not cluster under gravity. Now, this was something that, you know, four or five decades back, people would have found odd. But there is matter or there is a cosmological constant which behaves like matter which does not cluster under gravity. So vacuum energy, for example, does not cluster under gravity and would fall under this uh, heading. Then you can convert the, the universe is, uh, you know, I, I, homogeneous, uh, three-dimensional hypersurface evolving in time. But as you know, uh, you know, when you say homogeneous, it must be a surface of constant, three-dimensional um, surface of constant curvature. But curvature can come in three kinds. You can have a, you know, a constant positive curvature, negative curvature, zero curvature. So that's another angle of cosmology that you need to figure out. So you have a homogeneous universe, it expands, so there is only one function, it tells you how the expansion goes as a function of time, so one functional parameter. And one other thing is this thing, whether the overall geometry is curved positively, negatively, hyperbolic, spherical, or Euclidean, right? Pardon? I missed the part where you said constant. Why is it constant? Because you have homogeneous distribution of matter, and in Einstein's theory, the matter determines the geometry. So if your right-hand side is constant, uh, it's not a function of spatial points, then the left-hand side has to be also the same. Okay, so then it's very simple. So you can get to this in few lectures of cosmology, and you'll find that the entire evolution of the universe is captured in this algebraic equation. You take the capital omegas of clustering matter, vacuum energy or non-clustering matter, you convert this curvature density into some pseudo density. It can be positive or negative, so it's not really an energy density, but it's good to move it from the left hand side to the right hand side. Then this is radiation plus whatever you can imagine. Tomorrow you come up with exotic, you know, a network of cosmic strings that has an energy density of a particular kind, which you know is got an equation of state of uh, you know minus a third. So similarly, curvature density, something similar to curvature density. Now the question is at this time, and this density of course changes with time, and so this algebraic equation is always satisfied at any point of time. When I put a naught, it means now. Now we know from observations, which I'll talk about later, the radiation density is much, much smaller than these. So radiation density is four orders of magnitude smaller than the amount of matter that we have in the universe, clustering matter or anything. So it's an order of magnitude thing. So you can drop that out of the equation. So if I want to understand which curve are we on here, now I have three players. Amount of clustering matter, amount of non-clustering matter, and the curvature density. And this is the story in cosmology of, you know, kind of trying to take this algebraic equation and remove one term at a time or determine one in, with respect to the other. So let me uh, point out another thing that although the radiation density is unimportant now, there is something interesting about an expanding arena to work in. So there if you have galaxy, distribution of galaxies or non-relativistic matter, then the energy density actually scales as one over cube of the expansion, right? This is just the number count goes down. If volume grows, you know, if the volume is scaled up by a factor two, then the density will fall by a factor eight. But for radiation, it's a bit different. Radiation or any relativistic matter, not only does the number density of that particle go down, but also the particle redshifts, right? So then there's additional factor uh, by which, so it, this falls off as one over volume, this falls off as one over volume and an additional factor of length. So even though, although the uh, radiation density now is 10,000 times smaller than the matter density, when the universe was 10,000 times smaller, 
matter and radiation had equal energy densities. And beyond that, in the past, the universe was even simpler. It was a completely radiation dominated universe. You don't have to worry about any other content. It's a radiation dominated universe. And so early universe is radiation dominated. Now the question is, how well do we know the radiation content? I said it's uh, very small compared to it, but do we know it? And we have known it since 1965. This has been one of the most major breakthroughs in cosmology, is the serendipitous discovery of a radiation bath, which surrounds us. It's the dominant radiation content of the universe. Uh, I don't have the slides to show you that, but it you know, almost by a factor of 100 uh, overwhelms anything else any other background. X-rays and gamma rays are small. The closest is cousin is the far infrared background. It is black body. It's a perfect black body and that has implications I'll point to. And it is extremely isotropic. So in the past, if the universe was radiation dominated and the distribution of radiation that we see now is isotropic, then I don't need to you know like, um, you know, Mahindra was pointing out that the distribution of galaxies did not look as smooth. But the radiation uh, density that we see is smooth at the level of 10 parts per million. Okay? So, the, our understanding of this radiation is the following. So, we are here now. So, this is a hypersurface, three dimensional hypersurface evolving in time. So, and we are here and now. And I have, this is actually should have been called conformal time, but you know, uh, it's scaled such that light cones are 45 degree lines. So all the same radiation is coming along this light cone to us. Okay. And now as I go down this light cone, I'm going to a universe in the past, which is denser and hotter. When I go to a universe, which is 1100 times smaller than us now, factor of 1100 smaller, then the temperature, which is 3 Kelvin now, is 3300 Kelvin. At that temperature, if you look at the baryonic content of the universe, which is largely 75% hydrogen and 25% helium, that will be essentially in a plasma state. And this can be you know, seen in a lab. So 3300 Kelvin is not difficult to arrange for, and uh, you know, helium and hydrogen mix, so you can fire it at that thing and it will turn into a plasma. So the universe before that had a baryonic baryons in the plasma state. And plasma means that will be very strongly coupled, the free electron strongly couples with radiation. And you cannot look beyond this thing, it's like a fog. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's also called the surface of last scattering. So before that the photons are scattering like crazy, so no information can come through that opaque surface. And so it's opaque here, and it's neutral and transparent here. But once these photons were released, once the universe, uh, you know, became colder than 3,300 Kelvin, then the photons could freely travel from this surface. So what you are looking back on the light cone is a snapshot of the universe as it was at a redshift of 1,100. And if you wanted to look like an observer, this is the picture you should have in mind. We are here and now. As we look out into the universe, we are looking at the universe in the past. Even when we look at the sun, we are looking at the sun as it was eight minutes back, right? So we are not, you know, we are limited by the speed of light. So if we go 43 billion light years, 14 gigaparsecs away, then we will hit this plasma screen all around us. So every observer in the universe is blessed with a super IMAX theater, which shows you how the universe was when the universe was just half a million uh, years from what is called Big Bang, right? So, and our current age of the universe is 14 billion years. So, you can see that, you know, a nice analogy is uh, you have a 100 year old person whom you are trying, to, you know, you've seen now and you're also seeing his picture when it was one day old, when he was one day old, right? So, something like that. So, that kind of a scale. Okay, this is the COBE results where we did not see, we, from 65 to 92, we essentially saw a blank screen, except for a Doppler motion, which is not uh, as of great significance, uh, or you know, limited, more limited significance. But we started seeing structures beyond that uh, from the Kobe satellite that uh, flew. 
And the COBE satellite also told you another thing very importantly, nailed for you the spectrum of the radiation. The energy spectrum of the radiation absolutely fantastically matched the black body. So much so the error bars here have been blown by a factor of 400 to make them visible. Right? So it's one of the most uh, precise measurements that exist of a black body. It's probably the most uh, perfect black body we know. We can't reproduce such a black body in the lab for such, um, such a range of frequency, 60 to 600 hertz, uh, gigahertz, 60 hertz, uh, gigahertz to 600 gigahertz. This has an implication, sorry. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Then if you just look at the sky, mm -hmm. you see the background of the Milky Way, which is the Oh, no, no, no. So this is, yeah, but that's only part in the Milky Way, right? So the rest of it, you can look back and see. So I don't, seeing, the, uh, seeing this is not such a big challenge. There is some amount of background removal that you have to do, but it's not, not so much of a challenge. Okay, I mean, the only thing is once when I tried to take this data and plot it, no, no, no. So if you if you actually point uh, point a horn antenna, take the data. But the point is to get data over all this range of frequencies. But if you do that, it's not such a challenge to get that. If you have to look away from the Milky Way plane, right? And this looked all over the sky. Uh, this DMR. Uh, the, no, this, no, this was the far infrared radio spectrometer. So FIRES. Uh, absolute spectrometer. Okay, so this has a big implication because uh, if you are seeing a black body spectrum, that means you have to have not only thermal equilibrium, but you also have to have radiative processes thermalizing it, which did not conserve photon, right? So you have to have a universe. The universe must have been 10 million kelvins hot at the past. This is definitely known. So whether you believe the universe is any hotter or not depends on whether you believe in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And then if you believe higher energy theories, you can extrapolate it back. But we do know that uh, you know, the universe was at least 10 million uh, Kelvin hot just from this black body because otherwise we wouldn't be a, not have photon violating processes happening at all. Okay. Uh, and it also limits for you what all happened during the cosmic history there. And this is some area that, uh, you know, is going to emerge as one of the big areas of CMB physics, the spectral distortions in the CMB. There's a huge amount of information hidden there. And of course, TIFR has Rishi Khatri, who's the you know, one of the leading experts in this field. But uh, I'm going to focus more on the clustering part of it. So what gave rise to this structure of galaxies that we should See, so the belief is that the structures that we see in the galaxies arose from these tiny fluctuations that were seen by the same satellite, COBE satellite, uh, in another instrument called the differential microwave radiometer, which differenced uh, the uh, temperature between two points in the sky and showed you that there are fluctuations in the temperature at 10 parts per million. And uh, this picture is uh, half a million year old. This is almost 14 billion years old. You match these two pictures. So this is like a wonderful thing to, situation to be in physics. You know the initial conditions of the system, you know the final conditions of the system. You also believe that you know the mechanism, which is gravitational instability. You just dial the right parameters of the universe and you should have a consistent picture between them, right? But the part that remains to be understood still is what gave rise to this fluctuation in the first place. And that, I think, is the next uh, frontier. Okay, So just to put you to, uh, you know, kind of uh, point you to the challenges involved. So we have a 3 Kelvin bath. Then on that, we are trying to measure seven, you know, tens of micro Kelvin of temperature fluctuations. Okay. In addition, there is also a polarization pattern that we try to get and we have got, which is a tenth of this again, so about few micro Kelvin, five to seven micro Kelvin. And then we have another prize waiting if you go dig deeper down. I'll get to that. So this has been a relentless uh, pursuit beyond Kobe. So Kobe dominated the first decade of CMB observations, then came WMAP, 
which refined the CMB map. So Kobe saw the first fluctuation, but with very poor eyesight. So 10 degree resolution. This went up to some 30 arc minute resolution, half a degree. And then Planck has gone down to five arc minutes kind of resolution. Okay, so sensitivity and resolution is much better. And we not stopped at Planck. So already there are experiments which are much better than Planck in sensitivity running from the ground. And then there is a huge program called CMB stage four, in which will kick off in the mid 2020s, which will you know, go down in sensitivity even here. And you know, map out all the information that is there in the micro background. So that's the important thing to do. Because I mean, I hope I convinced you the importance of that surface, how, how important that is and how much information could be hidden there. Okay, so it's a relentless march, as I said, and uh, oh, I should point out that not only are these satellite missions, these are the kind of milestone missions, but there are a huge number of ground-based efforts, which are equally important and they have also made, you know, you know breakthrough discoveries. So what did we uh, achieve in these, uh, you know, through these three generation decades of CMB measurements. So we came and came to understand the standard model of cosmology. Okay, so we do have a fairly well determined picture of how the universe evolved, what are the processes in it. We have also established some of the fundamental tenets, like we know gravitational instability is at work. So we do, we can connect the fluctuations that we see at the CMB directly to scales that we see in the galaxy. So this is the baryon acoustic oscillation. So we've made huge progresses in understanding the background universe and the perturbed universe. So this study of the perturbed universe through physics is where Jim Peebles' contributions have been phenomenal, right? So let me go on with the observation. So this is the beautiful Planck sky map at a very low resolution. The color shows the intensity fluctuations, but at very low resolution. But that is just to highlight the fact that it measures the linear polarization pattern so beautifully. So, and I also wanted to point out that what you do is you don't really care about, since we don't care which part of the universe, so you don't care about particular features, but you want to look at the roughness of the thing. You look at the power spectrum and we determine, you know, we quantify that in terms of something called the angular power spectrum, which is this CL plot that you'll see L into L plus one CL where L is the multipole, and multipole typically tells you the angular scale on which the fluctuations are. So you're telling me how intense are the fluctuations in the temperature or in the polarization field at different angular scales. And you go from, you know, the scales as big as the, uh, you know, 90 degrees apart to 180 degrees apart to, you know, um, you know, sort of, uh, arc minute scales, few arc minute scales. And that's what Planck did. So it's a full sky map. You can see this beautiful reef pattern of linear polarization. But this is just to emphasize that this is a low resolution map. The high resolution map at 20 arc minutes looks like this. So we have resolution which are you know, far better. When you convert it into this angular power spectrum, which tells you how much fluctuation is there at every scale, Planck has this thing of actually taking uh, measurements right from the largest scales to the uh, tens of arc minute scales, right? And this is actual data with error bars. So you can see the error bars are not visible anymore on this. And it's one single experiment that's, that's very important. So WMAP actually came up to here, for example, in resolution. So here the error bars started becoming big enough. And then, so it's an immense, uh, Thing we have mined entire information that is there in the temperature fluctuations largely, right? And if you difference the data from this best fit uh, cosmological model, then you see that you know you can see the error bars, but you can see there's a fairly uh, nicely hugging the main point. Similarly, if you take the The error bars here are cosmic variance limited. He, on this side, it's noise which is picking up, instrumental noise. Uh, it, this uh, Planck is a cosmic variance limited up to a multiple of about uh, 1500. Up to here, 
actually you cannot expect to improve the data any further because of at least statistically unless there's systematic effect what are the oscillations? this is basically i'll come to that but these oscillations are i told you that the we are looking at a plasma screen so these are oscillations of this plasma screen so this is very basic resonant phenomena that is happening there and i will actually tell you and that's why i wanted to so th i'm just telling you how good the observations are and the fact that you can derive so the idea is you have similarly very good observation not great we have only mapped out 10% of the information in the polarization at this time but even that looks very impressive this residual signal has some kind of pattern is it too much to it or no no there's uh, these are consistent with uh, uh, noise in the thing there are, of, of course there's also variance right these are kind of you're looking at uh, different realizations you will have some scatter from that so they are very consistent with that uh, except for this this is a 2.7 sigma discrepancy here uh, from the results here i think this one is also significant but this later went off this was due to a, a cooler line you know this uh, instrument had cooling and one of the lines from the cooler was contaminating the data so this thing has gone off away so this is the old plot uh, <clears throat> so the game is very simple i have a very simple model of cosmology i can devise whatever matter composition i want i know how to work through the maths and ask what will with the cmb power spectrum be like so one of the first com computations of cmb mat radiation fluctuations was done by peebles and you in the 1980s in late 1970s in fact okay so there were these uh, so you can see that uh, this black line corresponds to a particular value of cold dark matter baryonic matter expansion rate and things like that and the game is very simple you take the data you take your model parameter space and then jointly vary all the parameters you can do it with a markov chain monte carlo and this is a visualization of that it's actual monte carlo chain that is uh, you know running with a code that my student uh, shantanu das had developed and you can see that as i change the parameters this black line is slowly trying to fit all the data and the deal is to find a set of a combination of parameters such that it fits all the data points the more data points you have the better the smaller the error bus the better and planck that's why is doing this much better but what is important is you wouldn't believe all this if you did not know what mahendra is asking what are these oscillations from are these just kind of you know fit to the data i mean i can fit that many gaussian and then try to map mimic the data but the good thing is we understand every single bump and wiggle of this okay and the, the physics there is very very simple the physics is of oscillations in the plasma so i have this plasma which is basically ionized baryons uh, couplings very strongly with the photons so it's a elastic medium because photons would like to uh, you know uh, sorry baryons would like to fall into gravitational potential wells whereas photons would kind to keep keep them the pressure of the photons will keep them from doing so so there's, there's a restoring force and hence the thing vibrates like a bomb, uh, drum and so question so are you talking in the opaque region in the, in the opaque region so we are looking back onto the opaque region and that opaque region is just like looking at the surface of a lake right now if i want to to look at the surface of a lake or you know figure out how well tuned a drum is or a tabla is so we do what every physicist here would know so i you know is to look at the green's function to get the linear response function another thing i wanted to emphasize is fluctuations are 10 parts per million so all the physics is linear and which is very important because then your uh, connections of the physics to observable have very little ambiguity nonlinear things have much more complicated things so what you are seeing here is a visualization of a green function exercise so what i do is ping the drum or i basically create a spike in the density perturbation in the plasma so what will happen is the baryons and photons which are tightly coupled 
will run away in a wave. Okay. Uh, we know now that there is there could be cold dark matter. So that will not because that doesn't couple to radiation. Anything that couples to radiation will run away in this uh, mode. And then as it's going away, you see that the wave front is stalling as the color changes from red to green. That's when the universe is turning from being opaque to transparent or from being ionized to neutral. So when it's neutral, the coupling between four baryons and photons is broken and there is no wave propagation anymore. So the around every spike like this, there's a ring. So in some sense, this uh, random fluctuations that you see in the CMB can be actually decomposed into dots with rings around them. Okay, that is mathematically equivalent. And uh, I, I don't know whether I should give this analogy to this uh, audience, but typically to undergraduates, I give an analogy. So if you look at a placid lake and there's a burst of shower, okay, so everywhere a raindrop falls, a ripple will go out, right? And you take a picture after 30 seconds, right? You will see choppy waters, but if you are a smart physicist, you could Fourier transform that. And you know that around every point that a raindrop fell, a ripple started, traveled for 30 seconds. And if you know the speed of propagation of the ripple, you would know that every raindrop had a ripple associated with it. So if I Fourier transform it, I will find excess power on that scale of one meter or something like that, right? So every ripple, but in the choppy waters, it's all lost. There's superposition of all the ripples, right? So something similar is, can be done with the same sky. So there is a hidden scale. It's the scale that this wave traveled to at the speed of sound in the plasma. So the speed of sound in the plasma is roughly square root three times uh, smaller than the speed of light. Right, so, and we know the age of the universe till then, how much or, you know, the conformal time till then very well. So then that is the distance it would have traveled and we know that distance to be 150 megaparsec in current units. So at the redshift of 1100, it's 1100 times smaller in physical distance. Why do you use the age of the universe to compute? Uh, it tells you that, the, suppose very, uh, I mean, so the assumption is this raindrops analogy, this perturbation happened at inflation, right, in our picture. So that's what I'm not understanding. The perturbation in the plasma behind this surface of... Uh, is oscillating, but the uh, perturbations were introduced. Uh, you know, you look at the plasma shell, the end of it is the, and the outer edge is the early universe. So something is perturbing it there. So that was the driving mechanism I was trying to... Uh, show in my picture there, so I should probably go back to that picture. See, this is the picture. So this is, we are seeing, this is actually a realistic picture. So you go 97% of the distance that you can ever go to, this thing is only 3% thick. You know, this is 3% of this. And at this edge is the earliest moments of the universe. So somewhere in the earliest moments of the universe, some physics perturb this plasma on this side. And we are seeing it on the other side, from inside. We can look at it, but somehow the drum has been perturbed here. So when that perturbation began, yeah. So it was a plasma, right? Yeah, but it created a perturbation in the gravitational potential. So whatever came and inhabited that will pick up that perturbation. The perturbations are actually frozen into the gravitational potential. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we are here. So this scale is something that we know very well, 150 megaparsecs, okay? Now you can do a lot with it, a lot with this physics itself. And there is a lot more to it, but I'm, you know, just telling you two essential things which I think any physicist will appreciate. One, only the matter that couples to radiation will propagate out in this wave. Right, so it has to have strong electromagnetic coupling. Okay, so that immediately tells you that this strength of the ring or the amplitude of the ring is a measure of, it's a bariometer. It tells you how much baryons is there in the universe. So, uh, okay, sorry. Before I go there, I, I should also point out that recent Planck thing. Actually, if, if you thought this was, this Green's function is 
just a construct. You can reconstruct this green function observationally. In the polarization map, if you stack up all the uh, sorry hot spots, you will find this ring standing out. Right? This is actually the same ring, but this is uh, you know reflecting the velocity pattern now. So you can see if I stack up the hot spots, then the polarization pattern around it is radial here, tangential here, which is two different signs of the velocity field. And then if I stack up the cold spots, the velocity field of course will reverse because around the under dense region, the velocity field will reverse. And if I do that, you see this reversal. Wherever it was radial, it became tangential. Wherever it was tangential, it became radial. This is actual data. This is simulation. Right? So these things should be in textbooks. This is the first time humanity has actually measured uh, you know, something which is 43 billion light years away, and you're measuring fluctuations of the plasma, and you can put it out in an observation observed form, the velocity field. So let me go back to the story of uh, the ripple. So the point is, when I look at the angular power spectrum, the first peak is essentially the ripple. And if you look in Fourier transform, a uh, physical ripple would be the trip scale of the ripple inverse, and then every harmonic of it. So this is the scale of the harmonic, and then there is a regular pattern of harmonic peaks. So these are not random peaks. These peaks fall, follow very nice harmonic series. And uh, the height of this tells you how much of baryons are there in the, is there in the universe. So this is, if the amount of baryon is 4%, which is what was consistent with Big Bang nucleosynthesis, then this peak should be at 74 microkelvin. But in the 1980s, CMB, uh, you know, people were looking for CMB fluctuations and already had gone to sensitivities where they ruled out these fluctuations at the level of, you know, 10 to 20 times larger than this, right? So if every mat, all the matter in the universe was made out of baryons, instead of 4%, 100%, that is 20 times more, this peak could be And that already in the late 80s, by late 80s, we had started ruling that out. So already in the early 80s, people were under pressure to realize that a fully baryonic universe, the same be fluctuations that it produces are ruled out by observations. So this is where uh, Peebles made one of his uh, first, you know, I would say, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> he, he found a way out of it, right? He said, oh, that means then all the clustering matter is not baryonic. There must be dark matter. And already Vera Rubin and had shown that there is, you know, Zwicky had pointed out there would be dark matter, matter that doesn't interact with radiation. But there the matter that doesn't interact with radiation could be something which is locked up in Jupiter's. It does not, uh, you know, emit, you know, it doesn't have nuclear reactions, so it does not uh, shine like a star. But here, he went another step saying, you know, this is matter which is absolutely, has no interaction with, uh, you know, uh, this thing. So this is the cold dark matter cosmology that 1992, Jim Peebles paper, which says, he worked out how this CMB fluctuation would be if the universe had, uh, you know, uh, dominated by very massive, weakly interacting particles, right? And then, you know, we also talked about the energy scale. So this is where the cold dark matter scenario in cosmology came into being. So he found a way out from these pressing uh, upper limits of the CMB measurements. The CMB measurements were ruling out a purely baryonic matter universe with adiabatic uh, things. The second thing that CMB can measure very well is the size of the ring, right? We cannot measure the physical size, but we can measure the, when I measure this first peak and the angular scale associated with it, say multiple of 220, then I know what is the size of that ring, uh, what is the angle that ring is subtending to me. Now that's very nice. So I have a surface 43 billion light years away. I have a 150 megaparsec sized ring there, I mean, scale there. I can ask, you know, if I draw a triangle, I have all the three sides. I can ask if the angles add up to 180 or do not add up to 180. If it does not add up to 180, then I'm inhabiting, my geodesics are propagating in a 
curved universe. So if it is spherically curved, then the angle would be larger than 180, uh, what is inferred from 180 uh, in a flat in Euclidean universe. Or if it is hyperbolic, then it would be less than that. And if it is exactly Euclidean, you expect the peak to be at 220. So this is just pointing to old data in 2006. So WMAP used to release the data, you could reanalyze it. So this is our reanalysis of the CMB uh, power spectrum from the WMAP first year data and the third year, uh, three year release. And you can see already the first peak was mapped out very well by WMAP, right? Planck has mapped out eight more peaks, eight peaks up to the eighth peak. And uh, then you can fit a curve to it. And in the paper, you can see that the third three year data gives you a amplitude of 74 microkelvin and the angular scale to be very close to 220, right? This is just a simple fit to the data, right? Parabolic fit. And already you can say that the baryonic fraction of the universe is 4% and omega curvature is zero. The universe is geometrically, the spatial hypersurfaces are geometrically flat, right? <coughs> So in this equation, remember there were three players, the clustering matter, non-clustering matter, and the curvature density. So CMB very confidently ruled this out, right? And then we also knew, and this is from the distribution of galaxies, already there were strong indications that the distribution of galaxies did not look like this, where the entire universe is made up of cold dark matter and this four person baryons. If it looked like that, then the current distribution of galaxies would look like, starting from the same initial conditions that uh, CMB provides. Then this is one possible distribution of galaxies, this one. So this has much bigger voids and you know, larger scales in the structure. And that one is a universe where the clustering matter is only 0.3 of the critical density or characteristic density, right? And this here, the omega zero matter should have been one. Right, so that is ruled out. So already there were indications that this is true. So if you go back to this equation, you know that this part is not something more than 0 0.3, 0 0.4, which means if I, if this has to be, there has to be non-clustering matter, you know, and this is how Peebles paper projected it. So let me again emphasize, so I have, I'm saying the same thing here. So let me point out. So in, oh, sorry, this is, 1984, not uh, Jim Peebles, uh, you know, actually talked about a cosmological constant model. So which later has become called uh, dark energy and, you know, Zeldovich and all pointed out that cosmological constant is very similar to vacuum energy. But he just talked about a cosmological, and you can see it's very simple. He says, if the matter density of the universe, at that time he thought it was 0.2 total clustering matter, if it's 0.2, and inflation tells you that the universe has to be geometrically flat, then the rest of it has to be a cosmological constant. And he worked out the CMB of it and you know the cosmology of it. So he somehow had almost forecast the kind of cosmology that uh, we are in now. It's a cold dark matter, uh, dominates in the clustering sector and overall, dark energy or, you know, actually the cosmological constant for all practical purposes, there's no observation which deviates from cosmological constant, dominates the energy budget of the universe. Sorry. So, but but in the structure formation thing, you showed the graphs of the two cases, the one you created without the lambda. Hmm. So that's intuitively, I can understand that is because the positive cosmological constant is there, takes a while. Uh, no, so... <laughs> Not quite, it's uh, this most of uh, thing is, see if I have, I know the radiation density is fixed, right? So essentially this uh, structures start forming in the universe when the matter density starts exceeding the radiation density. Now if you look at the epoch of matter radiation equality, if you are uh, three times less uh, matter, then it happens that much times later, you know, so, uh, or in this scenario, matter dominated over radiation earlier than this, right? So things started forming at smaller scales, then it could here, 
So it's a turnaround in the matter power spectrum. And here the scale, it's essentially because of this. It's not cosmological constant not pushing out. Cosmological constant actually, what it does is it, it, it completely switches off uh, growth of structures, but it doesn't push out the structures in any sense. So, because I these types of observations, people are there serious possibility that lambda could be zero? You're saying that it was known well before? No, no, no. So, we, uh, so that's a interesting political thing. So, I come from one community which, uh, uh, so what happened was by this time, uh, much earlier than this, so if what we first knew was that omega matter definitely was not more than 0 0.4. 0 0.2 is what people were saying, it was to keep changing, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So we knew that if inflation was correct, then you will have to have cosmological constant. But then there's also a possibility that you really don't want to bank on some theoretical prejudice, then you can have curvature density. So you will have an open universe. Uh, sub uh, this thing. So you will have just this and nothing else. And then this thing will give you an open universe. So people in the early 90s started looking at open universes. But um, 1987, there's a paper by George F. Sasho in Nature and, and many other authors looking at the distribution of structures in the universe, something like that I showed you. And already saying that the lambda dominated universe or cosmological constant dominated universe is a much better fit then uh, open universe, right? So 87, it was said. So the, our, in our community, the main thing was inflation told you that the curvature density should be zero. Well, it's a theoretical prejudice, but 1998, CMB data already was good enough to tell you that uh, omega curvature is pretty close to zero if it is not exactly zero, right? So already at that time, the community knew. So if you talk to our community, the feeling is the supernova guys in 1995 said the universe is decelerating with a little more data in 1998 completely turned around and is accelerating. Uh, a lot of people feel that the confidence came from the fact that, you know, you saw a geometrically flat universe and we knew that the, you know, uh, cosmological constant or something that accelerates the universe was a serious possibility. So, you know, there are people in my field who show you two papers side by side and the data sets side by side in supernova. So uh, it's an interesting story there. So this is a very algebraic line. You can see the people's abstract already kind of says that obviously. If clustering matter is not there, then the rest of it has to be made by cosmological constant if your universe is geometrically flat as inflation dictates. Okay. So I think uh, this is the story then. So we have a geometrically flat universe. Then you start measuring the parameters. Planck gives you extremely good parameters. And I think, you know, one of the questions people ask is why people's now this year. So he could have got it with the Kobe guys because, you know, that is one point or any time in between. So my own reading, this is just my personal guess, is Planck completely finished all its data release in 2018. And this is probably the most comprehensive uh, measurements of the universe that exists at this time. And it actually brings out the two thing paradigms that he brought in, the cold dark matter and the dark energy. So it's probably timely in that sense. Okay, so as I said, uh, the universe is simple but exotic. The expanding universe itself is exotic. But the fact that 95% of the energy density is unknown to us and in dark matter and dark energy is exotic. But uh, I don't know if I have more time or I'm already out of time. Five more minutes, okay. So I wanted to point out then what next? What, what are we doing in the field? See, these two, of course, are big challenges. And these are largely left, this is largely left to the particle physicists and they are looking for cold dark matter candidates. This part, I think, is best left to whoever wants to do it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a puzzle, right? I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges to... Cosmology. I mean, I remember when I started my PhD, I asked uh, Padmanabh and Paddy, what should I be working on? What is the hot problem in cosmology? This is 1990 or 1990. He said, oh, you should work on the cosmological constant problem. So I started looking at a cosmological constant problem. And I came across the reviews of modern physics by Weinberg. Uh, 
I look through it, and I said, if for 15 years, 20 years, people have not figured it out, I am not going to work in this area. So I actually backed out of that. So I think things have not improved any, any you know, iota more from then. We, we absolutely don't understand why it should be close to zero, and why, it, if not zero, then why is it so small? Right? But there's one aspect we can understand. See, the whole uh, thing was, all the great success of cosmology was based on this perturbed universe. And I told you the perturbations were generated in some early universe. And why early is can be also explained, and part of it is goes back to Rishi's work and all that. I mean, the kind of work that Rishi does. So you can perturb the universe very early in the early, and that means we are missing some ultra high energy physics which can generate that. We have a good guess for that, and we think it is quantum fluctuations during inflation which does that. I assume most of you are aware of inflation. It's a phase of very rapid expansion that happened absolutely 10 to a minus 35 seconds from what is called Big Bang, right? And in such an expanding, uh, accelerated expansion, extremely exponentially uh, fast expansion, uh, what happens to quantum fields is very straightforward. I mean, in the sense that it, you can work out fluctuations in a dc universe, and it has an infrared divergence. So any fluctuations that you have starts populating the k tending to zero mode. And at k tending to zero mode, you essentially, you know, your wavelength is infinite, so your things are not fluctuating anymore, it's frozen. So what happens during this phase is you're creating fluctuations on the universe on very large scales, okay? And these are largely classical, and a good way to understand as discussing with Spenter this morning, uh, is Linda's description of it. That's the most intuitive way to understand why these should be classical. And it's very obvious to see if you're large occupation number, then of course the commutation between n and n plus half doesn't really matter. So n of k plus n, n of k plus half. So it looks classical. Although there are people who, purists who disagree with that, but I mean, I'm happy with that. So this is the phase we want to understand. And where, where are we stuck? We have actually an universe where we know it's homogeneous isotropic as inflation dictates. It is flat, geometrically flat as inflation wanted. It has a power spectrum of fluctuations which is nearly the same at all scales as something nearly digital like would give you, the scale free form. There are density perturbations, of course, because that's what gives and rise to this thing. So we've checked all this. We also know that the density perturbations don't have any entropy associated with it. Okay, that's very important, but I have not yet gotten into it, but that's absolutely beautifully nailed by comparing the uh, fluctuation spectrum of uh, polarization and temperature. Polarization measures the velocity field, temperature measures the density field, and you know, any resonant phenomena, you know that density and velocity are out of phase, and actually, the, if you can line up the two spectra, you will see that our peaks and troughs are exactly out of phase in that. Right, very, very nicely. And the underlying statistics is Gaussian to the level we checked. So one of the things that we really, really want to see before we declare that, oh, something like inflation did happen, is the same mechanism that gives rise to density perturbations, which is this dissiters, you know, uh, fluctuations of the inflaton field, will also give rise to graviton fluctuations. And it's the same, same equations. It's a massless, gravitons are massless, minimally coupled fields, and these infrotons have tiny masses. So it's essentially the same thing, and you should detect it. You should see a cosmological gravitational wave background associated with it. We have only upper limits, now, apart from that bicep uh, thing where we mistook uh, dust uh, to be that. So at this point, we know that it is 7% of the in amplitude to the density perturbations. And it's a must do for cosmology. If you want to really, you know, complete a chapter in cosmology saying we understand the standard model very well, then we must see this. And so I wanted to finish with something that has something that we started last year. So we proposed to ISRO. So this is some effort that is going all over the globe. Every agency, there are, you know, associated, you know, European, uh, community, American community, and everyone is proposing missions for a generation beyond Planck. 
And the problem there is it's a huge mission. It's a billion dollar kind of a bill if you want to do it correctly and well. So we proposed to ISRO that we should jointly collaborate with these agencies and actually launch a satellite. And uh, this is called CMB Bharat is actually the name of the consortium. Somehow the name of the project, actually we had called it ECO, um, Exploration of Cosmic History and Origin. Uh, but this seems to have stuck uh, in the minds of everyone calls it CMB Bharat. Uh, so this is to measure all the information that is there in the CMBs. Now, to measure rest of the linear polarization thing, as I told you, only 10% has been measured, so 90% is left to measure. And when we do that, we would actually potentially be able to see these fluctuations, uh, the gravitational waves. These gravitational waves are guaranteed to be of quantum origin. Okay, that means quantum theory, quantum field theory in curved space time is correct because you know it describes two phenomena that we know at the same time and they'll be you know kind of very interesting there are this is of course a risky game you know the gravity of amplitude could be even smaller in some cases and but there are guaranteed things we will measure the neutrino mass total mass number of species and the new this total mass will be measured with such accuracy that we will tell you the hierarchy of the neutrino hierarchy okay we will map all the dark matter and almost all the baryons in the universe it's a huge legacy thing because the cosmological model, you know, you already saw it's very well constrained around a particular model. If it is actually the correct model, we'll improve the constraint by a factor of 10 million with the data. And there's very rich ex galactic and extra galactic uh, astrophysics. So half the papers of Planck were on extra galactic, uh, galactic physics and like mapping out the magnetic field in our galaxy and all those will be done at amazing thing. And then if we have spectral thing, the kind of thing that Rishi does, we would actually have a way to probe the entire thermal history of the universe starting from an epoch of a redshift of 2 million to now. Okay, so it's got path breaking science, high value science, legacy science, and similarly, a lot of things for technology. So what we are looking for are these particularly handed patterns you know, so I showed you uh, radial and tangential patterns in the polarization. These are mirror symmetric, but these cartwheel kind of things are not, and that are a telltale signature of uh, gravitational waves, which are shear fields. Okay, and that signal could be anywhere at 10 nanokelvins to 100 nanokelvins level. We will be at least able to rule out, if not anything, that thing. It's a very challenging satellite. Uh, but many of the challenges are already, you know, we know how to deal with them. So it is a hot payload at, uh, I mean, service module at 300 Kelvin, room temperature. But these bolometers sit in a focal plane which is cool to 0.1 Kelvin. It all has, sits on the same satellite. So there are separate stages between the hot phase and the, there's very interesting optics here, only it's, uh, uh, you know, cartoon shown here, but there are three mirrors made of silicon carbide, which Leos is capable of doing uh, at some level. So we are uh, looking into that. And uh, so this would be a fairly large mission. The satellite is 4.4 meters in diameter, four meters in height. So it just fits into the fairing of a GSLV Mark III. Okay, so it's a two ton satellite. It has to be launched to the second Lagrange point. So which is uh, away from the sun and it will point away from that. That's where Planck was, Herschel was, many, but India has never sent any vision to L2 yet. So that will be the first. It has uh, also the challenges of data communication and you know, you have to improve our data communication for capabilities. And all. So this will be maxing out the launch capacity and all other capacities of ISRO, if ISRO was to take this up. So I'll stop here and uh, take questions. Yeah. So, what about the mass density? You showed about the photon density that was kind of log, log k as well. I mean, fit, is there a way to fit delta d versus l, the function form? Oh, this uh, with this wiggle and all that. Uh, the mean thing you can put. Oh, okay. So the fall off that you were seeing is an uh, essentially an exponential fall off in k. Okay, that is because of something where you know. 
uh, I said the baryons and photons were tightly coupled and were oscillating. If it were so tightly coupled that there was no slippage, then these uh, peaks would have been almost of the same height. But what happens is the, there's a, you know, drag. The baryons are not as tightly coupled because, you know, the photon is tightly coupled to the electron, but the electron has to pull the nucleus with it or the proton with it. So this whole system has an inertia. So that part and that slippage from there gives you a fall off. So mass too has similar depth. Mass also. Matter has similar form or different? Matter, matter has a different power spectrum. So if you look at the matter power spectrum, it. Uh, so if you look at the matter power spectrum, which is again, it goes up, comes down. Okay. But the underlying power spectrum initially was something like this. Okay. It was something proportional to wave number K. This is a, this turnaround is at a scale K equality, which is the size associated with a causal radius at the time of matter radiation equality. Okay, but this is actually a uh, power law follow up. This is a power law modified by power law here. And there's a transition. This is the matter power spectrum. On this, because why is it featureless? Because cold dark matter has not participated in the oscillations at all. And that dominates the matter budget. But what in 2004 we found is this one has tiny wiggles. Okay, because there is one sixth of the clustering matter is baryons, and the baryons did do this uh, wiggle that baryon acoustic oscillations have been measured in the galaxy data in 2004, and it has been improved. This is called baryon acoustic oscillations. So uh, that's the amazing part. But I mean, and funnily enough, when this was measured, I was teaching a course in cosmology, and I was talking about this effect that if it was 10% baryons, then you would see this at 4%, there's a very little chance that we'll see it. And next class, I had to come and correct myself. I said, no, it has been seen. So uh, this was done by uh, the SDSS. So you see, and this scale that you see here, if you take this, translate this, and map it to the radiation power spectrum, they match. That is what tells you that the fluctuations that you're seeing in the radiations, the you know, are exactly the same fluctuations that are imprinted in the galaxy distribution. So that's why gravitational instability is one mechanism where, you know, the same wave numbers are amplified. Okay. The simplest kind of non-Gaussianities are very, very strongly constrained. Okay, now, and that's, uh, I should emphasize that limits are, uh, there's a num, you know, kind of phenomenological number called FNL, which is used to do that. That would be zero for a Gaussian thing. We have constrained it to be plus minus, you know, five, right? So that kind of a level uh, from Planck. Uh, and uh, just to clarify that it's not that we cannot measure, we actually, to get that limit, we actually measured known non-Gaussianities because we know certain couplings give you non-Gaussianity, but these are not the primordial non-Gaussianity. And that is of, about a factor of two, three larger. So we measure that and then remove it and then put this limit. Scalar, scalar, scalar yeah. Yeah, but then you have to measure tensor and this thing. So those are there. And depending on which scenarios you're looking at, they could be large. Uh, they you know, some kind of uh, models, uh, modified gravity models there, you know, DBI and all that, they have very large non-Gaussianities and they've been ruled out due to the yeah, so Tensor scalar scalar one in particular is fixed by some bond in it. Like that's total inflation. Mm -hmm. so this is like a stress tensor with two, two uh, uh, scalars. So it's right. fixed by some, it's just gravity, the way gravity is measured the mass of this. So right. So this guy is fixed by something, but I was just asking that any, is there any chance that in the next 20 years that we would be able to you know, yeah, so uh, the direction in which people are thinking are uh, in terms of, see, in, with, in, just in terms of information, the theoretic way, in CMB we are measuring a two-dimensional uh, data volume. 
So that's finite. But uh, we don't have the third dimension. But if you're measuring neutral hydrogen fluctuation, you also have a third dimension. Okay, so once we start measuring neutral hydrogen fluctuations at large redshifts, potentially you have much more information. Hence, you can put much stronger bounds on the non-Gaussianity. But uh, with CMB, I personally don't see this improving. No, it, it will get to a limit where you'll start getting to FNLs of plus minus, you know, plus unity or something where we know FNL of one kind of order one is expected even from just the nonlinear growth of structures. Are they quantum in nature or are they just classical states? Which one? Just the different quantum. Ah, so the question is, yeah, so uh, they are, I mean, in inflation, these are quantum fluctuations which grew to large scales, behave classically. Now the question one asks is, can I infer the classical nature of this? Uh, the quantum nature of this? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, so there, is, there are various views. I'm not an expert in this. There is certainly a decoherence of, uh, of some kind because we are only measuring the growing mode. The decaying mode is not measured. So we have already lost information. So we are tracing over some information that we are not uh, measuring at all. When we are measuring large scale structures and CMB, we are measuring only one part of the perturbations. So I, if I wanted to reconstruct a quantum nature, I need to be able to entirely, you know, do the Bogolovov transformation. I need both the modes, the growing mode as well as the decaying mode. Yeah, right. so that's related to this thing. You know, one, one way you would uh, is differentiate quantum versus classical is by measuring a bell inequality. When you have bell inequality, you need uh, some things that don't commute. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is related to what you said. You need the value of the field and also the value of the conjugate moment too. But precisely because things are classicalized, you can't see the yeah. conjugate momentum, and that's related to what you said. You see a two dimensional projection. So this thing you said about neutral hydrogen fluctuations, that in principle also allow you to measure pi and pi dot. No, so and that's what I'm saying. So there is some additional, not just the 2D uh, projection. Yes. The fact that uh, these are perturbations that we are measuring. See, when I look at the growth function, uh, when it's a sec second order differential equation. It has a growing mode and a decaying mode. What leads to structure formation is the growing mode. The decaying mode doesn't. So that means in terms of the mode content of that fluctuation, I've already lost information about the decaying mode. I cannot recover that because it's hidden somewhere, right? So I would already assume that you can never reconstruct back the quantum state because you have already lost information. So you've already traced over some of the degrees of freedom, right? There were two, two parts to your modes. There's a growing mode and a decaying mode and the decaying mode is not part of your observations at all because that's kind of uh, not there at all. So you don't know the, I mean, uh, am I making sense? Yeah, we can, no, we can look at it. Yeah. So you can measure the, see, we can measure the density as well as the velocity field through polarization. Right. So you the end of inflation, something that's sensitive to the moment, the, con the canonical momentum of so Yeah. No, so there also my worry is you can measure much more accurately, but you will measure the growth, uh, growing mode extremely accurately, but you would have lost some information. So I don't know whether that is enough to rule out a, a test of that kind. But you have to keep that in mind. But other than that, maybe I, I don't know that you can get. Uh, I mean, that, that depends on, I mean, this is beyond where my cosmology starts. So it will happen at the Planck era. Uh, I'm sure when gravitons are tightly coupled to everything else, maybe there is a thermal, uh, you know, thermalization of gravitons with that. But um, I don't think, but I mean, in our current scenario, the inflationary epoch happens after that. So any primordial, uh, you know, CMB-like thing would have been diluted away by inflation.
Yes, sir. Yes, yes primordial neutrino background is, uh, as far as I know, very difficult to measure. Uh, I'm not, again, an expert, so Amol or someone would be the best person to ask. But I can tell you one thing in cosmology, that if we don't have three light neutrino species, our calculations will not match the observations. So we do assume that there, there is a, you know, 1.7 Kelvin neutrino background in our calculations. So in that sense, yeah, so there was this nice paper, again, uh, talking about uh, this today's paper. There's another Mercury paper which made a big, I mean, this is something that is known to every cosmologist when they learn things, but they converted into a very uh, prominent paper which got a lot of uh, eyes from the particle faces saying that cosmology proves that neutrino background exists. Because you can do a model with and without the neutrinos, and you can show without neutrinos there is no model in the standard paradigm which will fit the data. Thank you. Thanks.